um, like I had said just earlier, um, Paula Bronstein, who is who's in Ukraine, could not make it, but um, because of logistics and um, couldn't get an internet connection. So, but we had already recorded Wolfgang, who was going to be presenting tonight as well. So, what we'll do is we'll run the uh, the interview that I did with Wolfgang, and then we'll come back right afterwards. So, Jay, hit the button. Let's ride. All right. So all of this stuff, um, none of it is from this past like week and a half that I've been here. This is all from uh, my trip here in the fall. I came in October and November. And, and Wolfgang, just just let us know how many times have you been there? You know, just give us a little bit of background of what the last year looks like for you. Uh, so I came here for the first time. My first ever time to Ukraine was last January. Um, and I had planned on being here for a couple of weeks to work on an environmental story in the Donbass, kind of revolving around um, contamination from coal mines into the local watersheds and how the war that had started in 2014 had made that a larger issue. And looking forward, if this did turn into a full scale invasion, how that would become much worse. As it turned out, I ended up just doing like wire news in the trenches for close to two months before everything broke out and then ended up staying here for a few months after that as well. And came I, I left here in May in 2022 and then I came back twice more that same year, once in the summer, once in the fall. And then I just came back again uh, in the first days of February now. So this is my fourth trip since last January here. So on this trip, um, I don't have anything pulled together for you guys. Um, we've been kind of, we've been out in Donbass for the majority of this time. And we have slowly just been waiting to get accredited to work with the military. So it hasn't been a whole lot of like really anything uh, super new anyway. Um, we did just get that accreditation. So we should be able to start getting to work now for the, the next two weeks. Like every time you come here, it's kind of like you have to like just re-wait in line in the queue to like get things rolling for like a week or two weeks um but when i came here in the fall like a lot had happened in the like month leading up to when i came back and then a lot happened right when i got here with um ukraine had launched their um counter offensive in kharkiv oblast and then uh, at the very end of summer and then during the fall they pushed again into parts of luhansk um they took the large-ish small cities of Izum and Liman were the two big ones. So most of what I centered around um, on the trip here in the fall was kind of covering these, um, these liberated areas that had been under occupation. The Ukrainians regained control of them and kind of like what life looked like and what life might look like going forward for a lot of these people. They were deoccupied, but now their infrastructure has been largely destroyed. They don't have heat. They don't have electricity. They don't have running water. And we're heading into the winter months. And Ukraine is very brutal in the winter. So, so that's so, kind of so Wolfgang, with, with all that infrastructure um, destroyed, how does that relate to you getting what you need to be able to shoot again? You know, all, all that paperwork and everything. Is that all done online? I mean, do you have to go somewhere to get it? Just give us a little context of that. You know, that situation. Oh, so, uh, so what I was just talking about with like the little like hiccups and delays with stuff, um, what I myself and what a lot of people uh, struggle with just time wise is um, getting accredited to work with like military or getting to work like directly on the front line. So like in some of these um, very front line areas like Bakhmut at the moment, Chasov Yar right now, um, Zarichny, Torsk, which are also front line and then like Vugladar, which is one of the areas that you've probably seen in the news down in the south. Um, those are like super frontline, they're a bit hot, so you have to get military clearance to be allowed in there. So we all have um, like a Ministry of Defense accreditation to just work in the country, basically. And then you'll have to apply for local accreditations. There's like, as the war has gone on, it just it's become more bureaucratic, which is reasonable and expected. Like there's just more hoops and more levels to jump through. So this local accreditation just to work in Donbass, like with anything military or close to the front, we had to apply for that. Um, that took about a week and a half. So we did just get cleared on that. And now we can start hitting up the individual officers for things that we would want. Like if we want to do civilian evacuations with police from some of these frontline areas, now we're able to talk to the police officers or now we could 
try to do like an embed with 30th Brigade outside of Bakhmut or something like that. Um, and they check all but, that, huh, Wolfgang? They check that when, when you come up to a certain point, let's see your paperwork when you are actually on the ground. Yeah, so there's there's certain areas um, where you have to be on a list to get in. And if you don't have like the clearance to get in, you're not going through that checkpoint or that block post. Um, so yeah, some things, it, it's a security measure. They're at war. They don't just like want any anyone wandering through, you know? Um, and some of the areas too, it's like they want to be able to if it's an area that's more hot and they're experiencing shelling every single day, they kind of want to keep tabs on who's going in. Like if you're a journalist or if you're a volunteer that's like going to drop off food, they want to, at the end of the day, be able to like account for, okay, like this person entered, they didn't leave. Like, where are they? What happened with that? Um, so I'm assuming that's a big part of it. Also just keeping tabs on everyone. It's a country at war. They have to like keep their eye on things. Okay. So yeah, as far as like, I mean, this last trip, uh, when I was here in the fall, we didn't really have to, most of what I covered, we didn't have to deal with a whole lot of that. Um, in Liman, uh, we did have to get on this list daily to get into the town, um, just because it was a little bit closer to the front line. Um, Zarichny at the time and Torsk were being fought for. So uh, that's only like 10 kilometers away. So the town would occasionally get shelled but other than that like it's pretty much just like you drive you as long as you have the general accreditation like you can get into wherever you want um so yeah we i didn't have any like really logistical hiccups as far as like filing or anything like that we would um i believe we were staying at a hotel in uh Drushkovka for most of that time so that was an issue we had um all of that but anyway so yeah we uh we kind of focused on the issues surrounding deoccupation and what life looked like for a lot of these people that had lived under there. So all these photos are from that month um, in the fall, mostly October. This is um, outside of Izum. Izum was a city that was uh, captured by the Russians in, I believe, May, June, around there. Um, and then it was deoccupied at the end of the summer. I'm not, maybe August, maybe end of July. I'm not sure, but, um, it was quite destroyed. So this was a photo that went along with, um, all of the grain issues that Ukraine had. There was lots of like rockets. There was lots of destruction to a lot of like the fields there that had caught fire because of this. Um, this is a little village outside of Izium where there was a, a church that was semi-destroyed. It was also used as a um some sort of base or like a medical triage um for russian forces before they were pushed back um inside there was a lot of like medical equipment and whatnot you'll see in a lot of these areas that are occupied like basically any large building quickly gets used for some sort of purpose whether it's like medical area or whether it's like a sleeping hall for soldiers like when you have say like a brigade level of guys where it's like a thousand guys in an area it's like easier to kind of keep everyone in bigger pockets than just be like everyone go find your own house kind of thing so i i personally haven't been in the military but that's how it seems to work here that every they like a company will all stay together or something like that um this is right outside of zoom um there was a family that we had met that was uh pretty open to talking i believe they're in another one of my photos that they had just returned after after the occupation they'd been staying in i believe it was uh kremenchuk or Dniepro, somewhere along the Dniepro river um and then once the area was freed up they had come back home um but they weren't sure this is immediately across from their house there was a graveyard and the sun was setting when we met them and i just liked kind of how that frame came together but uh, this is that family. They had um, they'd come back off after the occupation and they didn't have running water now. They didn't have electricity working, so they weren't sure how long they were going to stay. The um, this is a uh, grandma in the middle, mom on the right and then her son. Um, I don't have the captions here. I don't remember their names, but the mom was dealing with something. She had had a um, intestinal surgery immediately before the war, like in January or February. And um, had to get a few feet of her intestines removed and the, like all surgeries sometimes there's complications after the fact and like she had like a mild infection that had just been getting worse and worse and worse and she wasn't able to go to the hospital this entire time just because of like the medical system is completely overburdened but um 
yeah, I would have liked to have stayed in touch with her. I'm sure that she's probably gotten the treatment that she needs by now. This was months ago, but hopefully they did. They did act on that. That was a worry of theirs at the time. Um, so this is on, so in between, I'd done most of the work in between like um, Izum and Liman, and this is the road that you take from Izum to Slavonsk, and then Liman is kind of off of that road. Um, and about halfway in between these two cities, Slavonsk, which was never occupied, that's Ukrainian held, and Izum, um, there had been a lot of fighting kind of pushing up and down this highway and kind of the whole stretch, you would just see destroyed ordnance from both sides. I believe this was a Russian tank, usually things facing towards Slavonsk, that was Russian, things facing the other way, that would be Ukrainian. Um, but and how do kind you know whole... if it's safe? How do you know if it's safe to be on that road? On the, uh, so actually on the road, it looked pretty safe. Like there's no mines literally on the road, but the entire length of the road you would see, I don't know if you can see any here, but there would be like little red square signs with a skull and crossbone that say mine in Cyrillic. And you don't walk in these fields. It's like really stupid. Either there's like landmines actually out there. There's anti-tank mines that have just been pushed to the side of the road so that cars could drive that had been at a block post. Um, or there's cluster munitions that are just unexploded that are just sitting out in the fields um so really not smart actually one of these days um they were this is still pretty recent after the occupation of all of these so there were road crews that were working on cleaning up the road if they saw mines that were supposed to identify dsns as like a like the overarching um administrative office that deals with like firefighters and rescue services and whatnot and inside of that there's a group that deals with like ordinance disposal and that's actually been around for a really long time they're still to this day picking up stuff from world war ii so um those guys the the harkev branch of this was working in this area one day we went out with them and i believe in the course of like two hours that we were with them they picked up 80 tank mines off of the side of the road in just one stretch um, and some of the areas are much more polluted than others, but all along this, it was really bad. And, um, so one of these road crews that was working, they have, um, I don't know the term for that, like a front end loader, like one of those big, like scooper things, you yeah, know, like yeah, a bulldozer. Yeah. Like a um, so one of those was on the side of the road. We had driven past in the morning. It wasn't there. We drove back later. It was there. A tire was popped. There was a big puddle of blood. And then the next day we drove by again and there was like a little like shrine set up for like a little grave marker for one of these road workers that had just been killed from like they hit a landmine with that. So, so, so those, those mines, of course, will stay like you referenced World War II. I mean, for, for who knows how long. I mean, and you can't even work those fields. Right. I mean, yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah. It's a huge issue. Um, so the, the, the area like in between like a lot of like Kharkiv region, um, there had been some very serious battles in World War II when the Germans came in and they pushed the Soviets out. And then when the Soviets came back and pushed the Germans out, there was a lot of fighting in that region. So it's super polluted. And right. now even more so because that's seen some of the most fighting. Um, so whether it's um, actual like intentional landmines or if it's just unexploded ordnance from like a rocket that never blew up or if it's... Both sides use a lot of cluster munitions where it's like a rocket that opens up and then it's basically like a hundred hand grenades fall out. And sometimes those don't blow up. Usually that's like five-ish to maybe higher percentage rate that they don't blow up. So the field can just be littered with those. And then like sometimes if you're driving like a combine tractor over it and you hit one of those, that can blow up. Um, What's her name? I, I don't know if you know Svet. Um, Jacqueline, she, uh, yeah, she, yeah, yeah, yeah. She's, yeah. she was supposed to come here and we were going to be working together, but she ended up going to Turkey. Yeah. She, um, she presented the, uh, the other night and, um, she was documenting a guy who was driving a truck and went over a mine and he lost yeah. his legs. Yeah. So, it's, oh, it's, okay. Yeah. It, it, it all, it all sort of connects there. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's absolutely terrible. I have a, photo coming up um that kind of it, it touches on that uh, that fortunately the guy wasn't injured but yeah same thing where it's like a civilian in an area um that's polluted by mines and he had to go to but so this is a gentleman outside of his zoom in one of these little villages there's a boatload of villages where it's like 15 houses that i don't remember the name of every single one of them but uh this guy's house had been leveled his primary house a lot of people will have this uh place in the back here is um 
they usually call it like their summer kitchen. So it'll be like a washroom, a kitchen, um, just kind of like one bed for guests or something like that. Um, it's kind of like just like the, the outer house. It doesn't have all the amenities that you would have in your primary place. So their main house was destroyed. They're kind of picking up bricks from this and like building like a new wall around their property and staying in the back house. But um, we had hung and out those with him folks, for a little bit. They get to that pretty quickly, right? To try to reorganize and make it neat. I mean, it's one, one unbelievably thing. so that's like one thing that is like really just like blown my mind here is like how like tidy and quickly like yes. ukrainians kind of like pick up the pieces it's like really remarkable and T tidy is like a, yeah it's like a i don't it's it's like part of this is like an overall like stubbornness i think to the society here and like part of that comes out in this where like people like want to carry on with their lives they want to pick up the pieces they want to move forward and like very quickly and um you'll even like in Kherson at the moment I haven't spent a lot of time there but like you constantly see like photos of people the whole city is under shelling but like you still get people that are just standing at bus stops like waiting to go to work and like just really carrying on with everything like people walking their kids and um Crazy. yeah it's a it's an interesting facet of the society here how yeah. quickly things kind of get turned around there was when I first got here on this trip in October that was when literally the first day I was there in Kiev is when Russia started sending missile strikes towards that city and a lot of others targeting infrastructure and one of the locations that got hit was right out front of a university more towards the downtown a missile had hit an intersection literally the next day they had dug out the whole ground, refilled it with asphalt, repainted it, and it was like nothing ever happened there. And like they just like need to repair and fix and build up. Um, so, yeah, that's a, a super interesting thing. This is in uh, Brovery is one of these little villages kind of um, along the Oskol is a river that heads down towards um, Izum and then connects to, I believe, the Donetsk uh, River. But all up along this um had been occupied on both sides and uh the ukrainians had pushed the russians back um as you see many places the bridges get blown that's usually from the ukrainian side to have um slowed the russian advance at some point um so you'll get a lot of times like where it's like a little footbridge gets built by either civilians or the military um and people just carrying on with their lives another bridge that had been destroyed um and at this point there had been there was a lot of people like out fishing and tried to get an image of that i actually did go back to the same place um maybe it, it was this bridge they're actually there's like a full engineer crew there now kind of building um a giant like berm stone and dirt embankment to like get up onto this bridge and like further fix it at the moment and this whole river is completely frozen solid and there's like ice fishermen out there now so i got basically like the same photo just different season again i mean that, that i mean this this the first thing that comes to mind is huckleberry finn just you know fishing on the side of the mississippi right i mean it's like nothing's going on that's amazing it's really amazing. yeah yeah i mean it's like it's if you don't want to move like i mean here in this area like once it was liberated like there wasn't a whole lot of shelling like they can't neither side is crossing here like the river's quite wide it doesn't it's not like strategically important so like there's not a lot of like shelling or anything happening and so if you can get out of the area and get food and like some people are fishing for food um why leave is how a lot of them feel like why like you have a house here that you own like you don't want to go have to re-get a job somewhere else pay rent somewhere else and etc cetera, etc cetera. um yeah. um this was just nice light on the side of the road at um around the the oskol when we were driving the one day we ran into a bunch of um soldiers who were doing target practice um just out there had nothing to do with like in combat they were just like zeroing their rifles and stuff um we did find out later in the day i'd gotten a flat tire and we had driven over a shell casing that i pulled out of my tire and had to get that repaired uh that was, I believe, tire like 11 or 12 at some point. I've gotten 13 flat tires now in Ukraine. But uh, yeah, this is the, the same guys there. Again, no. this is uh, part of a school that had been destroyed along that region of the, the Oskol and a lady. You know, seeing, the, seeing those guys do the target practice, the, um, you know, and imagining that there could be mines there, right? You know, the nervous tension must be a constant 
right? I mean, like, w- which can lead, yeah, you know, I think all the stress. Maybe for the soldiers or, like, maybe maybe they're just more used to it. Maybe they're more observant where they're walking. Yeah. I'm sure if you were a soldier and, like, you've worked in Bakhmut or somewhere that's super frontline, like, I'm imagining that, like, you have a good system down for, like, always just being aware of, like, where yeah. you're stepping. Um, this could also be an area where there wasn't a lot of fighting took place. Like, when the Kharkiv offensive happened for the Ukrainians, it was as the whole world watched it was very rapid so i'm sure there's lots of areas where there wasn't the time to like mine it or there wasn't heavy fighting happening there so there's not really unexploded ordnance in fields or anything like that um it's just that nervous energy that must be a constant for a soldier in war right i mean just oh yeah yeah that that's what i was really speaking to yeah that's crazy god yeah yeah there's it's, some people seem to handle it like remarkably well some people it's just like a constant anxiety um yeah. it's kind of like i don't know if it's like a trained thing or if it's a getting used to it thing maybe some people are just born with it better maybe some people learn to adapt to it better but um yeah it's not i don't know i, I have days like where like i hear shelling like in the morning and then i feel weird all day and then i have days where it doesn't bother me so much so i think it's for me it's more of like a headspace thing on like what right. i bring uh like on my plate into that day probably more so um yeah I didn't seen this uh so this was the first days that we were allowed back into Liman so Liman had been liberated um in the fall very uh in September and then the the Ukrainian forces kind of like locked it off for media for a few weeks and then um they opened it back up again I think they were just like corralling like any saboteurs or collaborators or anything and kind of just like getting the whole situation under control before letting media in um but this was kind of a a mass grave area outside the city most of these people had died from shelling and were buried by civilians and this is the um one of the local police offices mixed with like the war crimes unit from Kharkiv and what they do here is they they redig everyone up and they just like want to catalog who is who what is this and like get all the name so like everyone i believe most of the people that were here there was identification with them um there was like piece of paper or whatever or id that were in the bags with them because other civilians had brought them to like the far end of town from wherever it was that they had died um and buried them but it is still like the the official practice that they need to be exhumed they need to be re properly buried and properly cataloged um this is just in his Zoom. We've got an old, I'm not a tank expert, but a very old like World War II Soviet one. Um, you see a lot of this, like there's like these relics from like the Soviet era and a lot of these places where I'm sure you've seen in a bunch of these towns where they have like the the old MIG like up on a platform, like right when you enter town or they'll have these, these old tanks or like a big head of Lenin or something. Um, and this is the burned out city hall or some administrative building. Right yeah, one, one thing we, we've seen recently is, um, you know, when you have uh, one of those statues, they sandbag it so that mm-hmm. it, can't be, it can't be destroyed. That was really interesting that that they care so much about that piece of history. They don't mm-hmm. want that, you know, and then now there's somebody or the whole town is sandbagging this. Uh, yeah, the statue is really amazing. Also, more so, more so the Ukrainian heroes like uh, right. Tara Shevchenko and stuff like you don't see a lot of it with anything that has the hammer and sickle like this tank. Yes. You don't see them sandbagging that. Um, yeah. But yeah, so a lot of a lot of those in Kiev and you saw it in like Odessa and Kharkiv, um, the more like Ukrainian oriented monuments, uh, they some of them are remarkable. They're like 20 meters tall and like there'll be like a spiral of sandbags over the course of a few days right. going up. Yeah. Yep. Um, so this is in Liman. Uh, this is a man and his wife that are um, chopping up firewood, uh, getting ready for the winter. So a lot of like what I did, it was like trying to articulate like these issues of like energy crisis that these folks were going through and trying to photograph that. So like uh, people gathering firewood, people messing with like electricity or like rebuilding pipelines and stuff like that. This is just I, I love the Lottas. So every time I see one in light, um, I try and snap photos of this car. So as you as you're going on through through your you know shooting, you're still thinking of the environmental piece of this. I'm sorry, with what? With the environmental piece of this, right? Because you you went there thinking in that vein, and and you're seeing the ramifications of what war does 
to those systems? Yeah, I haven't I haven't really gotten to work on a whole lot with that, but I mean there there are many issues um surrounding that. I haven't really worked on anything other than like mine pollution and a lot of these forests and how okay. that's going to affect it. Um I've been wanting to do a bit with um like the coal mines that it's like getting way worse now. Um, but a few of them have just been shelled in the past year and they've kind of, um, a lot of them are owned by the state and then basically the rest of them are owned by one oligarch in Ukraine and access to all of the state owned ones and all of the ones from this oligarch have been shut down. So at some point, maybe in the future, I would like to work on it. I would like to cover more of that. Um, but this is in that building. This is a guy um, who he's still living in his basement down there with his um, his wife, his mom, his dog. This is the apartment that um, he had owned. And now they live down in the cellar. Um, this is also Liman. I think the next few are. These are some ladies that were living down in the basement. Their um, apartment building had um, caught on fire during shelling. Um, so Liman, um, the purpose of this city is that it was a huge railway hub that connected Russia to Donbass and then Donbass to Kharkiv and Dnipro and then further to Kiev. And like this was kind of like the huge connecting point between the two countries, one of them. And it's massive miles long railway junction here um, where goods come in and trains switch and all that. Um, this is uh, an elderly woman and a guy who are cooking outside because there's no heat, there's no electric in this town. And you would see a lot of this. This is kind of how we would meet people is like throughout the day, like you kind of just drive around, you walk around and most of the people are like outside cooking or they're like washing their clothes or whatever outside in water that they had to like go get from a, a well. And um, Um, this was in Kupiansk, which is the far end, far north end of the Oskol. Um, there was a guy laying here with a a note from a loved one who had, um, they had found him, they ID'd him, and they were just like asking for someone to pick him up, um, some authorities. Um, and this is one of another one of these bridges that had been destroyed and men are out fishing on the water. Um, we did some stuff with the military on the last time, ma mainly uh, Bakhmut area. Uh, this was <coughs> a tank crew, I believe, was the this trip um, where it's kind of interesting to find that in lieu of um, traditional i thought i had some more photos in there from this maybe they're misstated um so instead of using artillery all the time like traditional howitzers or like the mobile howitzer tanks or grads um with the introduce or with the introduction of the little drones like the mavic drones um one guy can be using a drone and be a few miles ahead and these guys in a tank can now accurately fire up to about 10 kilometers with fire correction and seeing where it lands with a drone they can move their turret accordingly and like within a few shots hit something the size of a car where that's well well beyond the line of sight but now you can use tanks as a form of artillery which was the interesting uh progress that's happening with the technology mixing with these like old soviet tanks that have been refurbished um so down here this is Kherson. this is another area that was liberated i spent a few days down there um in the fall um at, this is before the city of Kherson was um deoccupied but um along the way that some of like the northern areas of that province um i think I remember the one town name was um, Arhonholsky. I'm not sure if this was it, but this was um, this is a hospital here, and it had been used as a base for the Russians. And they had during the summertime brought someone's pool inside, and they were splashing around um, in the hospital. So she was showing that this is um, a few bombs had landed outside the hospital on the one side, and this is um her showing us around we had bumped into this woman and she graciously just kind of like became our tour guide for the day and showed us a whole lot of things and um she funny uh she 
uh, when the hospital was deoccupied, it was never like rummaged through by the Ukrainian troops. And she went through and she like gathered up a whole bunch of medicine and whatnot to give it to whoever was next. She didn't want like looters to grab it. And uh, she took us down into like her cellar where she keeps all her like pickled goods. And she had like cases and cases and cases of COVID vaccines that she was just like waiting to like give to someone. And it's like, I, I'm pretty sure these need to be refrigerated, but like it's a kind thought to do that. But she was trying to pass off like COVID vaccines for us if we hadn't already gotten them. But yeah, you, you know, the, yeah, all of us, I mean, and the, those soldiers would bring in a pool, you know, in, in the middle of all this. And you could just see them just, you know, frolicking in that pool. Yeah, there's a lot of I don't know. There's a lot of like just really bizarre moments in war and conflict that. It makes sense that you would want to do it makes sense that you'd want to splash around a pool like who wouldn't it's summertime right but like you wouldn't expect to see that in the throes of like when you think about like i'm gonna go cover conflict for the next month it's like i'm kind of anticipating like just seeing horrific things and like listening to the traumas of individuals but like there's just like so much like we're human beings and we do weird stuff and we experience weird quirky things and like that doesn't stop in the middle of conflict so like you do get a lot of that and that was one of those moments um and, and how do you digest that wolfgang kind of that weirdness yeah you know, i don't like, i think that i think that really lightens and humanizes everything to be honest yeah. i think that if it was just non-stop trauma and it was like there were no light moments like where i could chuckle um i think that it, it would be much harder i think that this kind of like it helps like ground the situation and like remind me that like th this is who we are as a people as humanity it's like we do fight but like we do still do like these like stupid funny things and it's like mm -hmm. it's impossible to like unravel the two of those so i think it's a it's an important thing to show in all this yeah, like, absolutely. Can't really, like not every single part of war is just people dying and death and destruction it's like there is a lot of like amazing moments of resilience and, right? and like the yeah. silly goofy things yeah um th it. this is in our um this was a the building that i'm in and this closest one this is kind of a u shape and i'm at one end of the u um was a school that was used as a base and i believe it was hit by the ukrainians while it was a russian base um so a big part of it was destroyed and that's an apartment complex that was blown up in the the back and um this is one of the ones that I don't usually do this, but sometimes I like, like if I'm not in a rush, just like there's a there's a frame here that's like waiting to happen. And I saw that like the clouds were gonna open up and there was these birds that kept like flying from that building in the back to this one and back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. And I probably, I spent like 30 minutes, like just kind of sitting at the spot, like waiting for something to come to fruition. And- um, But that's the same thing, right, Wolfgang? I mean, like, you know, it's coming from a photographer standpoint, right? This is going to be a spectacular shot. And in the middle of all this, you know, I'll wait it out. It's going to be it's going to be a beautiful shot. Right. I mean, the, the, yeah. and that must be, you know, uh, sort of um, what's the right word? Sort of leveling for you. Right. For a moment, I'm going to get a beautiful shot. Yeah. Yeah. I think that I mean, it's like a weird thing. And that's an important question on like trying to find the beauty in such tragedy and. I think that like the way that I reckon with it is that it's like I I want to come and photograph these and like do these situations as much justice as possible. And to do that for myself is to try to make these images as I guess beautiful, like at least compositionally, like to make sense and to kind of like draw empathy from folks. And if it's if it's just a shitty photo that looks like you snapped it with your iPhone, it brings that out of people less. It's like, if it's a video, it's like, we've we've all seen videos that it's like, this is really remarkable, but it's not necessarily shot well. But in like the world of photography, it's like, it kind of, it demands a little bit more of us and we should rise to that. And we should strive to um, really try to make images that do draw that empathy from folks and make them curious and make them want to know more and kind of like, ask some questions with the photography and is it therapeutic for you or a mental relief to come upon a moment like this sometimes yeah sometimes definitely there's like a um kind of like a calmness and like the waiting and like a satisfaction and like when it all comes together whether or not that's like it, it, it could be in this situation it could just be like 
I am like shooting street photography and just like waiting for this one person to like walk into the light kind of thing. Right. And it's it's a similar thing to that, but like here it serves like more of a a purpose than just like someone walking into the the right light kind right. of thing. Um, because I, I mean, twenty minutes before this frame happened, it's like the the clouds were all the clouds that you're seeing to the right and everything was just like gray and flat and like there was like no three dimensionality to it um and no it's great yeah you i think waited. That, it's great that you yeah waited. yeah uh this is the same thing just looking up um here this is out front of the building we were very cautious walking through it this is how you say mine in ukrainian um so I don't think anything, I don't think there was like live landmines in there, but there was like unexploded ordnance that was in there, like uh, small mortar casings, it's like small, like the little 40 millimeter grenade things for the grenade launchers, um, that sort of stuff. A lot of the buildings in this town would have mine warnings on them. Um, again, a lot of, this is one of the oldest ones. This is one of the first ones you can tell by the round headlights. This is just like the stereotypical like Russian, like piece of shit car that like that everyone's like super divided on like this thing is destroying our environment it's disgusting it's an eyesore for like our people and then there's like people that are just like can't get enough of it and it's just like an iconic vehicle of like the entire eastern european world um you, you know it's funny you, you use the term piece of shit like what a piece of shit like those russians are leaving these buildings i know we'll drop a couple of mines in here too you know, so when these people are trying to start over or even their own people, mm -hmm. they'll blow themselves up. I mean, like, what a piece yeah. of shit as a human yeah. being. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's a, that mines are an absolutely terrible thing. Mm -hmm. um, but there's a, we, um, we're supposed to in the next week hang out with some more of the guys that do do the, the demining in this area. Here, there's another mine sign in the back. And this is one of, this is one of my other like favorite forms of transport that you see in Ukraine. Um, it's called a motor block is the translation for this. And it's literally just like an engine that has wheels on it. And then you attach that to a wagon and you sit on the wagon. Um, and then it's powerful enough. Like you use this thing mainly for farming. Like you can hook up a plow to it or whatever you want. Um, it's kind of the same as like a big, you know, the industrial like walk behind lawnmowers yeah. that you see like landscapers yeah. using. Same thing as that, just without blades on it. Um, so people will cruise around on these things. It maybe goes like five miles an hour, but it's, it's the equivalent of like a horse and buggy, but it's mechanical. Yeah. And, uh, so you see a lot of that out here. Also, this thing is really cool. There's some photos like where I just, I, it says Ukraine to me and it's like the nuanced little things that you see in the village. And that's like, there's a flatbed version of a motorcycle It's so cool to me. Like instead of the sidecar that someone's sitting on, it's just like you put your tools here, you put your planks of wood, like whatever it is that you need. Get going. Um, yeah, I absolutely love it. Like there's like so many little things like about this country that just like completely captured my heart. And, and that other shot, you know, the previous shot of, uh, you know, the guy found himself, I mean, where did he go get the lumber to start? Oh, new? so down, down the road, um, there's some sort of NGO or volunteer service that was distributing lumber and um, tarps and people could take this and they could go rebuild their roofs or they could like tarp off windows, like plastic sheeting kind of stuff. Um, so I don't know that they were going and fixing people's homes, but they were at least like distributing supplies. And you'll see that in a lot of these um, liberated areas. Like there's kind of like a huge hodgepodge of things that like you wouldn't normally think of that people are distributing, but like basically a small home depot got set up at the end of town. And all the stuff's free. Like you can come and you can take this. Yeah. And, and it's great. I mean, you know, from a, from a standpoint of like when people make donations, there's your donation, right? You know, you're, mm -hmm. you're sending money somewhere and they're buying wood and people are. Yeah. 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 That, that's a really good thing to see actually. Yeah. Yeah. It was, it was quite incredible. Um, these guys, um, this was right across from one of those uh, schools from the, the earlier image. Um, and they were, they were repairing their roof with these, with these supplies. And this was just like a moment, there's a guy to the left that's talking to them. And, um, I just photographed two of the folks from the family. So this is back in Limon. And I believe the next, like quite a few are just kind of covering, um, the issues of energy in the area. Um, these people didn't have, um, they had just gotten electricity again is what it is. This is the same kitchen. And here's the guy like tinkering with his light bulb, um, they were excited to be able to have electric and not have to use like a little generator. 
Um, this is this is in a Zoom. Um, that's a bunch of kids. They're playing soccer in a field that was undestroyed, but their school is in the background, and that was blown up um, during the occupation. Mm. Actually, had so these kids uh, ended up uh, kind of thieving uh, the fixer that I was working with. They stole his pack of cigarettes and then extorted him for like a few hundred grivna so like five bucks to get the cigarettes back which was pretty funny um and they like left me go perfectly fine and were like had like wanted me to send them like all the pictures and stuff but like they like robbed this guy that i was with which really cracked me up mm -hmm. um this is in a zoom this is a building that had been uh um leveled in the middle from i believe an airplane bomb and uh there was a church in the back also a zoom um uh same area this is uh folks cutting lots of wood um getting ready for winter there's a lot of prep if you have wood stoves um gearing up for the winter this is that same guy in his in his place uh so here this is the same thing that Svet was talking about with uh civilians driving over landmines so outside of his zoom the forests are heavily mined from unexploded ordnance a lot of these um this is a butterfly mine which is a super tiny little very I believe it's like nitroglycerin or some volatile liquid that's in there I could be wrong on that but it's something that's like volatile to the touch that it gets shaken and it explodes um they call them butterflies they call them dragon's teeth and it's kind of like a little roundish part with like a fang hanging off of it so that when it falls it like flutters and kind of spins and they disperse like a few hundred of them will come out of one rocket and they'll disperse and they're plastic on the outside like there's the claim that it looks kind of like a toy and kids will play with it and lose a hand or something but it's not it's not a device that's intentionally like it's not going to kill you or at least an adult unless like a random piece were to hit you in the head or something so like we've seen a lot of injuries from these and like when people step on them you'll lose all your toes or you'll lose your heel depending on like where you step on this so like it will it'll render someone immobile like you're not gonna go fight in combat after you step on that but you could learn like you could walk again um but it's for soldiers like that person's out of the war um so this guy he drove over one of those it destroyed his tire and his rim but the rest of his car was fine and um he was driving out into the woods to all of these trees he had gone and cut down and like to get ready for winter they have to drive into these mined forests and they're cutting down trees even though they know the danger for this it's like it's also dangerous not having enough wood for winter so this is a uh, neighbor of that last guy and uh his kids as um he's cutting wood getting ready for the winter that, that must be an incredible task for parents you know with their kids right the kids want to run and play and yeah, go these guys had seven seven kids these guys had yeah that must be Talk about nervous energy. God. So this, if any, if anyone that makes photos watches this and like they know I'm an idiot or they don't know about this yet, if you try to make this type of photo, have a filter on your lens. I like seriously fucked up my lens with like getting a whole bunch of chips of like I wasn't thinking about this like oh it's just like little pieces of bokeh that are these imaginary lights flying at the lens no it's like little shards of metal that will like just repetitively chip your camera lens so I found that out and um I should have had a filter on the end of my my lens and a new Whatever. lens is a new lens is on its way yeah yeah not yet i mean it, it's like the camera still works fine it's just like i won't be able to sell that lens ever or i have to pay like a bunch of money to get the front element repaired um so but yeah this guy uh while well, he's he's cutting the sheet metal and they're making wood stoves for their neighbors um is what's happening here getting ready for winter um okay here's some more this is military stuff again this is outside of bakhmut we would occasionally do some days hanging out with the the military there uh this is through that guy's little viewfinder um this is some large I don't know the name of it it's an older howitzer piece I don't know why these are jumping around a bit like this because I I had some photos of these tanks firing but um so yeah this is just um one of these like little armored personnel carriers driving through a 
a village. This was on our drive home one day, like around the Oskol, where there was like some shelling happening off in the distance, and you could see where it was landing. Um, so this is back to one of the days with the military. I'm not sure how these got labeled because this was like the first group that I showed you, but um, those traces in the sky, that's like a Russian uh, fighter jet leaving trails. And um, for about an hour, it just kind of kept doing circles. And like every time that it would like round the circle and start like facing towards where we were hanging out with this Ukrainian tank crew, it was kind of like a few seconds of like anxiety on like, is it going to do something like near us until it like kept going in its turn around? Um, and I'm not a fighter jet expert. It's like, I don't know like what their vision looks like. Like I've seen like Top Gun and I don't know if it's like every single like metal thing on the ground, they get like little pings on their like display or whatnot. So it's like, I had like serious moments of anxiety, but it's one of those things where maybe I'm just super inexperienced at that. Um, but the, the guys that we were working with, the Ukrainians, like seem to be like, nah, it's fine. Like you can't see us. So like kind of cued their thoughts but like i had my like worries every single time that thing went around a bit, a bit. um here this is uh the the tank that i was talking about earlier firing and this is back when it's in the fall there were still uh lots of uh sunflowers in many of the fields these are the guys happily driving along then um so then this is the second time where that's a different uh vehicle this is a self-propelled howitzer that's more of an a it's an actual artillery role it's not supposed to be a battle tank um and there you go i think this was yeah that was the last one yeah this one i just like because it's like very it feels like apple screensaver kind of right photo and it's just cool what cameras can do now when you fire it at like one forty thousandth of a second amazing really amazing. did you freeze are you there no i i didn't freeze you unless J, J, i don't think jay did oh, okay. yeah well yeah that was everything that i oh. that i pulled together um so you're there now and what's your plan um basically i we're going to stay for a few more weeks, at least out in Donbass. Um, we have this, the one year mark is in a couple of days. I don't really know like what we're going to be doing for coverage. It's just kind of like day to day stuff. Um, but stay here for a few more weeks. We're just going to see how like access turns out. I think that my, I have to be back home in April for my mom's getting married and that's like a mandatory, like must be home. So uh, yes. I'm super yeah. excited for that. Yeah. I've got a suit that I get to wear for the first time. Um, and then send photos uh, of that. Yeah. Yeah. I'll send it over. Um, but we, uh, I'm super excited. And uh, then at some point in the spring or in the summer, the Ukrainians are going to, do their offensive. And then I think it'll be back to um, working in a lot of these liberated areas again, hopefully. Hopefully the Ukrainians have a successful push once uh, all of this like Western aid comes in with the Leopards and the Abrams and, and, and more stuff. What, what do you do to uh, decomp you know, decompress yourself, right? After you know going through this and seeing everything, you know, do you have a, a mechanism for yourself just to like, level yourself you know as you get um, home and come home yeah i think it's just like coming back and like being slow to like re-enter like my spaces with people and stuff like it's like a lot of times with friends it's like i'm very close with both my brothers and like i'll like go out like rock climbing with them and stuff and i don't have like a huge huge issue with it like me like the this is the first conflict that i've covered and like my main difference that i've noticed with myself like coming back to the regular world is like this like first person or first world problems thing where like people like will complain about or like make like a mountain out of a molehill with like things that now i don't find as significant right. as maybe i once would have um and it's like harder to engage in that I, I do try and work on that i try not to like belittle what anyone's going through but that's kind of a different main, context right yeah if i have to think of something that like i do have like a little bit of an issue with it's like it's that it's something that i do work on but right uh, 
that is the one thing that like I come home and it's just like, ah, oh, like I have to listen to like this about this and blah, blah, blah. <laughs> like hearing about potholes in Philadelphia doesn't seem as serious when I broke 13 tires <laughs> on right. this yeah. place. So, um, yeah. th- things like that. But right. yeah, just a lot of time with friends, a lot of diverse diet. Again, it's nice. That's right. like what I always look forward to is... I, I just like, I love the States so much for just like the diversity of food that you get. And it's like, I love traveling. Like I love going to places and like, just like learning all about like a different culture's food and like where it comes from and why they do this and whatnot. But it's like, it's so cool to be able to have like every type of food on the planet in like one city is great. Yeah. It's, uh, it, 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 you know, even hearing you say it, you know, sort of like says to us, yeah, you know, I really should appreciate that a little bit more. You know, it is a really cool thing. It's like, it's a really neat thing. And like, you're in New York, right? Like Philly is like the little version of New York. And it's just like, I feel like pound for pound, we might have like better food. I don't know. But um, we, I, I just like, love it, man. I love like being able to like, go get like Thai food, Indian food. Like you can get like awesome Mexican food. Like there's like amazing Italians, like in both of our cities, like you can yeah. just like get everything that you want. But yeah, but that's so much of all of America. There's, you know, there's great yeah. Italian, there's great, yeah. you know, wherever it is. So yeah. I, I guess another question. I mean, did you do you are you an Eagle fan? I'm a little bit bummed for my city. I'm not a big sports guy at all, okay. but I do sincerely appreciate living in like one of the most diehard sports cities. Like it's really fun living there when they win. And like I just enjoy like being a part like it's my home that like people are excited around me i really sincerely enjoy that um but it doesn't ruin my day or year when they lose i i didn't even watch the super bowl i was busy over here but um i did go to i covered the game right before i left the their nfc i think yeah the uh Um, the championship before, before they went to the super bowl i covered outside the stadium for that so some of the tailgating and whatnot and it's just like San, it's yeah, such again, a San Francisco. yeah it's like the rest of the it's like the rest of the world when they like watch their football soccer yeah. and it's a cool city for sports for that so well, can i cannot thank you enough for doing this once again and you know of course you have a standing invitation to come back because Unfortunately, we're going to have to continue doing this if by all um, by what we're seeing in the world there. Uh, it doesn't look mm-hmm. like it's ending anytime soon. So, you know, we, we want you to come back, um, you know, whenever whenever you'd like. And um, yeah, uh, after this trip, once I once I get some more stuff, once I learn a bunch more about everything here and have some more some more stories to tell. Did you guys ever get Yevgeny on here? Who? Yevgeny Malaletka. I don't think so. But I, I know I've reached out, you know, there's, oh, okay. a lot, yeah, there's a lot of people I've reached out that, you know, for whatever reason, the, the timing doesn't work or, it's you know, that people are busy yeah. and, and people are busy and, you know, but, um, you know, there's a lot of people who, who are on, you know, who are ready to go, you know, yeah. if, the, if the timing works, you know, then, then they're in. And, and I don't, you know, of course we, we don't say no to anyone because we want everyone's viewpoint and, you know, we want to keep, um, keep the audience, uh, you know, engaged to really see, but w- what's nice about you, this body of work you show, there's a lot of humanity there. And that's, you know, that's a piece of it that, um, you know, we, we need to see, you mm-hmm. know, the, um, you know, the strength of all these people is just really yeah. amazing. Um, so w- when you're ready, come back, we, you know, of course, be safe. Always don't, you know, don't take a walk in the woods, you know, <laughs> I don't need to go out in the woods for anything. So <laughs> yeah, don't, right. don't go anywhere near there. And, um, we will see you soon. So I give you the last right. word to, to close right. us out. Thanks so much, Jay. Thanks, Frank. Great. Thank you. Right. Wolf. We appreciate Have it. Have a good night. You too. Thank you. Art out of war. Yeah. Right. I mean, that's what photographers do. There's um, he's really talented. He's got an incredible eye. Find, finding uh, finding moments. Um, Frank, that lens uh, comment was hysterical. Yeah, it was really funny. I could hear you laughing, Jay. I think <laughs> I right? couldn't help it. Were you commenting? <laughs> Which as comment? soon as I saw that spark, I'm like, how did he not kill his lens? Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah. That's um, you know, I mean, there, there's a I couple of things you, know, you you talk about humanity. I mean, that pool shot, I've been thinking, because we recorded this a few days ago, that pool shot is just unbelievable to me. 
you know that that you know those guys would have the the wherewithal. I know we'll bring the pool into the building. <laughs> I mean, you can't make that up. I mean, that yeah. I mean, you know, you just. I mean, the craziness of war. It's um, but but that you know, this whole week has been a lot of that. You know, just the normal normalcy of war. <clears throat> you know, just sort of pervades the, these, you know, these crazy, crazy situations, you know, and, and him destroying his lens and the food issues and the cleanliness of, of the Ukrainians. You know, it's just, yeah, this whole week, is, this whole week, this whole year has really been, um, been intriguing on, on, on so many, um, on so many levels. You know, it's, it's, it's really, really amazing. You know, it's and, and I have to say, I mean, after you know going through this for you know all these presentations, we must be up to 30, 35, whatever it is. You really get a sense of the landscape of this country, the people of this country. You know, the, the one thing we didn't see this week, which we've seen all the way through, are animals and people taking care of the animals. You know, this we didn't see any dogs this 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 week. Or a few, a few, there were a few. Yeah. It's um, yeah. These folks are uh, courageous people, and you know that that's the citizens and and it's, you know these photojournalists that go and and risk and you know you know have this desire to show us um, is really you know they you realize when you don't have a good vocabulary to describe what people do because there, there should be I should have a better vocabulary, but um, you know that's the whole Brooklyn thing. Everything is just fuck you in Brooklyn. So <laughs> everything is fucking great or fucking terrible. You know, but beyond that, you know, that's, that's the little character. But these these guys, you know, these men and women, you know, who go and, and photograph are um are, are, are heroic. Heroes. In, in, yeah, in, in everything in everything we do, we have to tip our hat to them. Um I don't sell short the ability for you to convey meaning through the intonation of how you say fuck this or fuck that or fucking oh, that's true thank you brian it's very solid brian. you have to be able to read brooklyn brooklynese no brian, <laughs> brian lives in the nuances of yeah. the language i like that brooklynese, that's brooklynese. It. It's, um, yeah you, you you can't you can't lose it thank you brian for that for that uh, uh nuanced description i appreciate that very much um, but yeah, so, um, again, everyone, we really appreciate it. And, um, you know, probably in another three or four weeks, four or five weeks, you know, we'll have another, uh, another group of people. If you guys have any suggestions, um, you know, please send them my way, you know, or, or people that, you know, that uh, would want to present, um, that would be great. And, and we will get back and we will, I, I think on the uh, 22nd of March, we have, you know, dare I say, a normal projection where it, it, it's photographers, you know, just doing normal work, you know, not not just covering the war, which um, is how how this whole thing, um, whole projection actually got started through the uh, the push of my uh, my wife. And I, I, I can't I can't say that enough because if I don't say it enough, <laughs> there's trouble on there's trouble. But um, yeah, projection. We'll see if that comes through the side. <laughs> I remember the week that she subbed for you because you were sick or something. Yeah. A lovely woman. Beautiful. Yeah. And, and as I recall, Sandy, a lot of people wanted me to be replaced. And I think you were on top of that list. <laughs> Sandy, was it surprising? As, as I recall that, people. Sandy. Yeah, I mean. Well, she didn't torture you were, me. <laughs> <laughs> you, you were this close to being out, Sandy. You don't know. You don't know. But, you know, now, now I've done these presentations <clears throat> with malaria. I am not giving her another shot. <laughs> but um no in, in all seriousness I, I can't tell you how much i appreciate all you guys coming and what the photojournalists do and your audience and on and on and on so um everybody have have a great weekend and um you know we'll see you we'll see you